I should uh, lead people through a breathing exercise. Um, so while we get these ready, when I come to a, a conference like this, it's been a really fun day. And, and actually, I think there are two main things that I get out of an event like this. And so one of those, I learn about really exciting concepts. So these are ideas that, you know, it might be a new scientific finding. It might be just a new way of looking at something that I've, that I've known before. But these new concepts that kind of plant seeds in my, in my brain, and I know this happens to a lot of you there. And then a second thing that's exciting to me, I come to a conference like this and I can actually play with new products. I can actually test things out and I can see that I've got you know, the ability to, to demo a product that, that actually works. And so I think of those as, as two separate things. I think of it as there's the, uh, the conception of the idea. There's, there's something brand new, some idea. Maybe it's got a scientific foundation, but it's just an idea. And then there's the product, the actual, the actual product that you can use. And there's a process in between the idea and the product that actually it's is a really uh, uh, difficult process to go through. And you've got to turn a lot of these scientific findings into, into products. And so that's going to be the focus of my, of my talk. And the things that I hope you'll be able to get out of it, so the people in this room, you're in a kind of a, a tough situation because you're, you're pioneers of, of new types of technologies, new types of you know, nutrition or diet, or you're, you're pioneering new things, so you have to have an open mind. You have to be inviting of these new ideas. And at the same time, I hope that you approach each one with a bit of healthy skepticism. So you, you're asking the questions, how do I know this works? Why do I believe that it should work? Do we know the mechanism? Do we actually, do we know what's going on here? So you can get carried away with excitement and, uh, and kind of lose, lose sight of the fact that you want to test things out. And so I think I can, uh, I can go a little bit deeper here uh, without some slides and we'll, we'll get them. Oh, looks like they may be coming up right now. Sure, sure. So what I'm trying to avoid is the experience that we've probably all had about one thing or another, where you, ha you hear about some new exciting concept, okay? So I've got a, an image I'll show you about, you know, it's this drawing of flying cars, right? And it's okay, so flying cars, I can talk about the physics behind that, we could talk about how the propeller, you know, gives you lift, and, uh, and I can tell you there's science behind this, this should work. And then when you end up, you know, going through with it and trying to develop something based on that product. Why are we not all driving flying cars today? You run into a lot of things because it's actually very difficult to translate these scientific findings into reality. So, so again, I think this room in particular, pioneers of new technologies have a really, have, have a really tricky situation where you've got to be inviting of exciting concepts but really be, be skeptical and ask the right questions to, to find out if you've got products that work. And so, again, I've talked about uh, the promise of a flying car, but then what actually ends up happening, maybe, maybe it doesn't quite live up to the hype. So my own background, I'm a neuroscientist by training. I, I did doctoral and postdoctoral work with uh, electrophysiology, so I would actually implant very small electrodes into the brains of monkeys, not humans. So this is a monkey brain on the left, and I've highlighted an area of prefrontal cortex that I was particularly interested in. And, and I would do things to, to, uh, to find out what the activity of those neurons, the, the electrical impulses, the spikes or action pot potentials, what did they have to do with cognition? So what did they have to do with when the monkey was paying attention to something or making a certain type of decision? And so in some of my research, I used electrical stimulation of cortical tissue. So this is not TDCS, this is not uh, from the outside, but actually putting an electrode into the cortical tissue and stimulating and, and researching, finding out what happens with attentional uh, control with other cognitive behaviors. And actually in, in, the, uh, in the experiment that I'm showing right here, this was a, neuro, a neurofeedback study. So recording the spiking activity of the neurons in the monkey brain in this one particular part of the prefrontal cortex and I converted that into musical tones, played those back to the monkey, and then gave the monkey rewards, apple juice, 
either for achieving a high tone or a low tone. So basically train the monkey to voluntarily control the activity of specific neurons in this part of the brain and ask, how does that impact the monkey's ability to pay attention, the monkey's ability to, uh, to make decisions? And so this is really biohacking, but you can probably guess that my ultimate goal was not to make smarter monkeys, but I'm actually really interested in the ways that we can translate research findings into things that can, that can help everybody. So uh, for the last uh, eight or nine months, I've, I've been a product scientist at Lumos Labs. And uh, some of you may have heard, uh, heard about Lumosity. So our, our main product, Lumosity, is quite popular in the United States. Uh, we're just now kind of going through uh, a big push on internationalization. But the quick overview is that Lumosity is a brain training product. So it's a personalized and adaptive web product and mobile app. And it challenges these core cognitive skills, things like attention and speed, cognitive flexibility, problem solving. And, and so when you use Lumosity, there's a, a personalized training program. We kind of have the analogy of a gym for your brain. So you have your daily workout. And each daily workout is, is based on a series of games. So these games are directly adapted from research in neuroscience or psychology. Uh, and these are tasks that have been used in, in the lab or in the clinic, some of them for decades. So during that training, like I said, these are based on uh, neuroscience research. And, and during that training, we also show you feedback. We show you a, a sense of progress. So you can actually see uh, the progress of your brain training. And Lumosity today, like I said, is, is pretty big. We've got uh, over 70 million users worldwide and, and more than a dozen peer-reviewed journal articles, uh, more than 40 games. And my, my favorite stat up here is that we're, we're past 3 billion game plays, which I think, depending on how you define it, that's got to be the biggest kind of database of cognitive, uh, cognitive data in the world. It's, it's an incredible database. But, you know, this all started at some point with a single concept. So I'm gonna use this example as, as a way to kind of draw that path from a scientific concept to creating something that is actually testable, that people can, that people can approach with a skeptical eye. And, and hopefully for anything new that you're really excited about, you can approach it with the right types of questions. So the story behind the concept of Lumosity was that one of the co-founders was uh, completing his, or, or he was beginning his doctoral research uh, studying neuro neuroplasticity in the neuroscience program at Stanford. He was actually one year ahead of me, so I kind of knew him a little bit at the time. And another co-founder had a very different background. He was in finance, he was in private equity, and his, uh, one of his biggest projects was working with 24-hour fitness, so a, a, a gymnasium, a, a physical gym. And at the intersection of the neuroplasticity and the gymnasium came this concept. It's, can we actually create something like a gym for the brain? And okay, that's an interesting concept, but is there, is there scientific data to, to suggest that this might even be a good idea? How do, we, how do we think about this? So right around the same time, there was some interesting research showing that actually your brain can undergo physical structural changes with experience. And one of these studies, called the London Taxi Cab Driver Study, was a really, really cool example of this. If you were at the Hacking the Brain event a couple days ago, you heard my colleague Daniel Sternberg talk about this a little bit. So, so it turns out that to become a taxi cab driver in London is actually really, really difficult. You need to study for months and you need to know uh, spatially, you need to understand all of London's kind of network of, of roads and you also need to, you need to have facts about different parts of London. It's a, it's a really tough process uh, to train and, and be considered on the knowledge and actually be in the state where you can pass this exam and be a taxi cab driver. And so what these researchers did was they said, okay, what if we looked at the brains of people when they are on the knowledge uh, versus when they're not? And, and maybe could we see any differences in brain structure? And in fact, they did. They, they saw that when drivers were on the knowledge, they actually had an enlarged hippocampus. So the hippocampus uh, is an area that's, that's really vital for spatial reasoning and for learning, these, uh, for learning facts. And, and so this was 
pretty pretty cool, uh, you know, something pointing in the direction that maybe maybe brain training could be helpful, but you know, of course, structural differences in the brain doesn't necessarily mean that you're smarter. So if you're in this room and you're, you're taller than I am, if you're a bigger person than me, you probably have a, a bigger brain than I do. And yeah, you might be smarter than me, but it's not because you have a bigger brain. And same goes for someone who's smaller than me. So, so this is one piece of evidence, but do we have any, any evidence that actually using your brain, training your brain can actually bring about behavioral effects that are meaningful? So right around the same point in time, there was uh, there was a really interesting study called the ACTIVE study. So this was looking at almost 3,000 older adults, and they were split into four groups. So one of the groups had, uh, one of the groups was the control group with no, no training, no mental training. There was also a group trained on memory, one on reasoning, and one on speed of processing. And, and this research group actually looked at the behaviors of this, of this group uh, over the course of many years. And so not only did the people with mental training actually have improvements in basic activities of daily living, but also they could track their, through their uh, driving history, they could track the frequency of accidents. And it turns out that the groups with brain training actually had lower accident risk than the control group. And for the, for the group that had reasoning training, it was half the risk. Okay, so we've got these two great pieces of information. We've got something that, you know, training your brain can actually cause structural differences. And then we've got this evidence that training your brain can lead to behavioral differences. And so I think that, you know, those along with kind of other scientific literature right then, that's, that's great evidence that this is an exciting concept. And I hope that this is one way that you, that you uh, approach exciting concepts and you say, okay, is there reason to believe that this might hold water? that this might be interesting. But it's an entirely different process to actually turn that into something that works. So how do you start turning the concept of brain training into something that works and something that's testable? So the nice thing is that neuroscientists and psychologists and neurologists have been around for decades and they've got a bunch of tools that they've published. And so there are all these tasks that have been used in the clinic or in the lab for decades, some of them. And, and that might be a good place to start for creating these games. So let's, let's get a little interactive here. Um, I'll pick one, one particular example. I'm gonna show you a row of five arrows. What I want you to do is yell out as fast as you can. So you've, you've gotta be a, a vocal on this one. Which direction is the middle arrow pointing, left or right? Okay, ready? Left, left. okay, faster, ready? Right. Right, that was very quick. Okay, so everyone got into it, got a little bit quicker, but you might have noticed, even if you're sort of introspective thinking about how you did this, you might have noticed that when the arrows were all congruous, they're all pointing in the same direction, it was much easier, it was much faster to get that response out. Whereas when there was the incongruity, it was actually a little bit slower, and if you looked over you know, many of these, actually a higher error rate. And, and so this is called a flanker task. You're looking at the middle, it's selective attention to the middle arrow, and you're trying to ignore the distractors or the flankers on the side. And, and this has been used since 1960, and actually is a, a pretty sensitive test. Uh, the, this has actually been used to, uh, to uh, as kind of an alcohol driving under the influence uh, screener, at least in one place. Um, but we actually can take a task like this and, and turn it into a game that's, that's fun to play. So this is a game called Lost in Migration. This is pretty much a direct adaptation of the Erickson Flanker task, and you, your goal is to swipe in the direction of the middle bird and ignore the other one. So, so some of the games that you could create for, for brain training are really these direct adaptations of things that have been used for decades by psychologists and neurologists. And other ones are, are things where you can actually digest the scientific literature and you can create something that's new but it's kind of based on the, uh, based on the known ways to challenge these different cognitive functions. Okay, so great, let's say we've created some games. Now, you know, the million dollar question, how do we, how do we think about whether it works? What does it mean to work? So if I told you you're gonna get better at the games, of course you're gonna get better at the games. That's not really it working when it comes to brain training. If you do anything multiple times, you're gonna get better at it. So quickly, you know, we realize we've gotta have a different way of measuring cognitive performance 
that's separate from the games. There's got to be a way to, to actually assess cognitive performance. And, and actually, there are plenty of assessments of cognitive performance. If you're a neuropsychologist, then you have a whole battery of these assessments. The problem is, most of these are paper and pencil. You've got to administer with them one, one on one. And uh, you know, it's very timely and, um, and expensive to do so. So pretty early on, we, uh, we took some of these known assessments. I'm just showing a couple examples here. And we actually created an assessment online so that we could do this validation in, in a much more effective and efficient way. And so, you know, in the, in the upper left here, there's something called Corsi blocks that's, uh, that's used to, uh, to test your, your memory of spatial sequences. And we've converted that into a couple memory assessments here. Um, there's, a, there's a reasoning test, a grammatical reasoning test that we've adapted. And we actually have 17 of these different assessments, each one targeting a specific cognitive skill or set of cognitive skills. And again, these are entirely separate from the games. So if you're doing your brain training, you're never seeing these except as potentially a periodic assessment. Okay, so hopefully you're, you're approaching this all with you know, a skeptical mind. And so you're saying, okay, what would be the right way to actually test whether brain training changes your, your cognitive function in, same, in some way? And sort of the, uh, the gold standard of evaluating this type of question is something called a randomized controlled trial. So that might be something uh, totally familiar to some of you and maybe not to others. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you, I'm gonna walk you through how we actually ran a large scale randomized controlled trial to specifically test, do, do people who do more training actually outperform people who are doing something else? And, and I should say, you could ask this question just by looking at people who are using brain training. So I think that's a, that's, you know, a common, a common way to start, and that's what a lot of people at this conference are doing. They're saying, well, I've been doing X, Y, and Z for, you know, for three months, and I'm running faster. Therefore, I must, you know, it must be effective. It must make me run faster. And that's, that's definitely a piece of information. In fact, we can look at all of our users, all the people who do brain training, and we can see that the ones who train more actually have bigger improvements on several of the assessments. So, so that's great, that's a great piece of information, but what if it's the case that people who are fast learners just like to play brain games more, right? So what if it's just the case that the people who played more are also the people who are gonna be performing well on the assessment? That would, that would mean that it's not, really, it's not really brain training that's causing them to get better, they're just already better people. So how do we actually ask that critical question what is kind of the active ingredient? What is the critical part of brain training? And, and how is that affecting your cognitive performance? So what we did is we started by taking several thousand people and we gave them the pretest. So that assessment, uh, those assessments that I showed you, we have a battery of eight of those in a row. And so all of these people take an online uh, battery of neuropsych assessments. Then here's the randomization sta stage. We split them into two groups. So half of them, randomly chosen, get Lumosity training. So they do their brain training for 10 weeks, five times a week, about 15 minutes each time, okay? And the other half, we don't want them to just be sitting there because then we'd, we'd just say is, is you know, doing something active better than doing something not active. That's not really as interesting. So we wanted to say, well, we wanna know if brain training is actually better than something else that might keep you mentally sharp. So uh, if, you, if you ask you know, a doctor who treats elderly patients, what, what advice do they give to their patients to try to stay sharp? You know, one of the common answers is crossword puzzles. So we actually had half of the people randomly assigned do crossword training for the same amount of time. So 10 weeks, five times a week, 15 times each, each day. So now we've got these two randomly assigned groups and after their training, after the 10 weeks, they each take the assessment again. So that neuropsych assessment. And, and now we've got, so the numbers came out to, uh, you know, 2,600 uh, people in, in one arm, 2,000 in the other. So thousands of people, nearly 5,000 people uh, evaluated here. And we can actually ask, when we compare the post-test to the pre-test, if we just look at the improvements in cognitive performance, what's the difference between the people who did brain training and the people who did the crossword training. So jumping straight to the, to the grand result, you can see that 
the cognitive training group had more than double the improvement as the crossword group. So we're looking at a change in a grand index score. I told you that it was a, a battery of assessments, so we can actually boil down all of your scores from those to a single grand index score. We can see that the, the group that did 10 weeks of cognitive training outperformed the group, that, or sorry, outimproved the group that did crosswords training by more than double. That's pretty exciting. We can ask, okay, you know, we told everybody they should do five times a week for 15 minutes, but in reality, as, as everybody here knows, when you're, when you're trying to do some type of training, some days you're busier than others and you let it slide. And so we actually had people training for different amounts of times in both conditions. And so we could look at, again, the change in that, in that score, your improvement, as a function of the number of active days during the study. And what we can see here, for that upper line, that's essentially the value of each day of Lumosity training versus the, the value of each day of crosswords training. And you can see that the slope is about twice as high. So in other words, each day of brain training gave you essentially twice the benefit of crossword training when it came to improvements on the assessment. And in fact, if you, if you asked the participants, if you ask the subjects of this study, what was their experience, you can also get a lot of interesting information. So um, the, the biggest, most clear difference between the group with brain training and the group with crosswords training was, uh, was a reported improvement in concentration. And, and that makes a lot of sense. I, I, I just want to make a point that asking these self-report questions is really valuable information, but it really helps to have these objective measures. So, um, you know, if I think back to when I was in school, there were plenty of times when I took a test and I thought I did really well, but I actually missed some stuff, or, or the other way around, I thought I did terribly and I actually, I actually did well. And so my self-report of my cognitive performance is, is, is good, but it's not great. So actually figuring out a way, how do you convert whatever product you're interested in, what other, whatever new supplement, new, uh, new you know, training regime, whatever it is, how do you figure out a way to actually measure its effectiveness. And we can even break this down a little bit more. So that battery of assessments, we had eight different assessments within there. So now we've split it into each of those subtests. A couple of them on the left, these are memory tests. We've got a grammatical reasoning one. Progressive matrices is a problem solving. It's Raven's progressive matrices are kind of a standard uh, IQ problem solving uh, assessment. We've got a, a, an inhibition control or a cognitive flexibility assessment, arithmetic reasoning, and uh, visual search. And you can see, you know, for, for the memory ones over on the left, actually the, the brain training gave you much greater improvements than the crosswords training. Um, one exception here that I kind of like is the grammatical reasoning. And, and you know, I think there are many different explanations that, that could be true, but it's consistent with the idea that if you're doing crossword puzzles for 10 weeks, you're probably going to improve on, on, verbal, uh, on a verbal fluency assessment. And, and that's actually not the target of a lot of the brain training games. So you know, maybe it makes sense that that's kind of the exception there. And, uh, and, and maybe that's something that we could develop further in the future. So, so you might say, OK, now we've got all this information, we can compare brain training to crosswords training, something else that's supposed to, supposed to keep you mentally sharp. You know, is that, is that the end of it? Is that the end of the story? And what I really wanna, I think the core theme of, of the way that I hope we can all approach these things is that every time you find out something new, it should create 100 new questions in your head. So when you see something like this, rather than saying, okay, brain training, brain training is, work, is working in this case, um, well, can we get bigger improvements, right? So yeah, more than double is, is great, but can we get even bigger improvements than that? How do the specific games actually train each cognitive skill? And, and so what type of training is most effective? So we heard this morning about lots of kind of hints for doing training at you know, either a different type of the day or maybe different types of training. And so if you're doing physical training, of course you would expect that when you do different things, it's gonna affect your physical performance in different ways. How can we do that with the brain training? Are there certain games that are more effective? And are there certain combinations that work great? Can we expand this to address more cognitive skills? I think this is 
this is so exciting. So if we've focused on some of these core cognitive skills, like your memory, your attention, your problem solving, what about, what, what if we focused on math skills, verbal skills, if other types of cognitive skills, could you also see the improvements there? How would you test them? And I think the, the bottom bullet point here is one that's probably the most exciting and, and hopefully that's, that's generating all kinds of uh, questions within it, but how does this relate to cognitive performance in the real world? And so I showed you in the active study before that actual uh, car accident rates were lower for, for a group in their study. And you know, what are the ways that you, can, that you can draw a connection between your memory improvements here and your memory in the real world, or your attention improvements here and your attention in the real world? So kind of just to, to sum it up, I, I, I think that there's this really exciting process of taking these concepts that, that might be new to you and really turning them into products that actually work, that you can ask questions about, that you can really, that you can really see for yourself. And, and so at the beginning stage, I think that the reason why you want scientific research is so that you can say, okay, well, what research supports this concept? And why do I think this might work in the first place? Right, so why would this be a good idea? And then as you're developing the process, as you're developing whatever it is you're developing, you can build into that process some constant testing. So what's the best way to test the effectiveness, to figure out exactly what's working and what's not working? And, and critically, how do I make that an ongoing part of the process rather than saying, okay, we tested it and it works, we're done. So I really hope that this, uh, this kind of urges everyone who's pioneering, you know, just testing out these new, these new things to approach them with a bit of healthy skepticism and ask those questions, you know, how can we test this? How can we figure out if it's really working? Besides just asking myself, do I feel better? And for anyone who's actually acting on an exciting concept of your own and turning it into something, how can you build that testing into the process and make it an everlasting process? All right, thank you. I think we've got a few minutes for questions. I think I see one. Yeah, if, if you say it, I'll repeat it. Stop the training. So, so that's a great question. We actually, um, so in the case that I was talking about, this, uh, this crosswords versus brain training study, um, we had two time points. We had you know, the pre-test and then you do training and then a post-test. And so it was really just two time points. And so it's tough to, ask, to answer that question of what happens when you stop training. And, and we actually have now just very recently uh, made additional time points available. So, so we can start to ask that, that question over time if we check in again and we, we actually assess those same cognitive functions, do they do they decay over time slowly? Do they you know, go away altogether? Um, this is a very, very good question. So if you go back to the, the active study that I referred to at the beginning, so again, that was, that was not us, that was a, a, a different research group. They actually found effects that lasted for years. They were looking over the course of uh, you know, roughly a 10-year period, um, and they seemed to find effects there. I think that that's totally an open question for, for what we've been doing. So yeah, great question. Hi, have you found any correlation between people that improve through the game or app and their resilience on daily stress response? Oh, that's, uh, so that's something that I'm very interested in right, very interested in right now. So um, short answer is not quite yet, but we have, we have some interesting leads. So. Uh, when you play a game, or when you, when you take one of these assessments, it's true that you get an overall final score, but, but actually there are lots of interesting behaviors. You know, every time you're responding, we can actually measure something about your reaction time, your performance, and so the question of, you know, do we see something about how your cognitive performance relates to your resilience or your, you know, your stress resilience, I think there are ways that we could measure that. So we could look at, for example, when you get something wrong, versus when you get something right, 
typically you slow down after you get something wrong, even if you're not really aware of it. And, and actually, if you are very resilient, you might be going, uh, you might be able to kind of push through or get thrown off. Uh, sorry, you might be less likely to get thrown off. And so I think there are some of these behaviors that we could probably address a little bit through the data we've already collected. And then uh, for you know, a stronger answer, actually run a study on that. Um, I've tried, I didn't know about your app, so I tried with an app called Peak. Uh -huh. And what I've noticed was measuring heart rate variability. So a higher heart rate variability <clears throat> is a better relaxed state of you know, sympathetic activation. And what was really interesting is that through the gaming, the heart rate, so you are engaged, and that obviously HRV will go down. But the baseline for half an hour afterwards is higher. It's only kind of just breaching the double digit figure. Right. But it's quantifiable. Right. That's, that's, I, that's not surprising. I, I, I completely, yeah. So I think that makes a ton of sense. So um, another thing that you can look at, if you get some HRV readings that are, uh, that are fine enough time resolution, you can actually try to, try to track that, try to plot that out. Um, I've read some research looking at the effects of different stress interventions on your recovery time as measured by something like that. And, and so, so actually using, using brain training, using Lumosity as a way to, to give yourself some kind of cognitive stress, some, something that's very challenging, rather than physical stress, and then monitoring that, that decay, that would be incredibly interesting. Right. Thank you.